Welcome to Dhammasika Meditation Center. Today is June 1st, 2014, and uh, we are here with Bhante Bimla Ramsey. And tonight's talk will be Majima Nikaya number 135, the Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta, the shorter exposition of Kama. Or as they say in most circles, karma. Kama is Pali and Karma is Sanskrit and that seems to be the most popular. (coughs) When does the pollen stop off the trees? It's pretty soon. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pindika's Park. Then the Brahmin student Sabha, Todiya's son, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. <clears throat> when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and asked the Blessed One, Master Gotama, what is the cause and condition why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior? For people that are seen to be short, short-lived and long-lived, sickly and healthy, ugly and beautiful, uninfluential and influential, poor and wealthy, <clears throat> high born and low born stupid and intelligent what is the cause and condition master goat <coughs> there it goes again <coughs> What is the cause and condition, Master Gotama, why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior? Student, beings are owners of their actions, heirs of their actions. They originate from their actions, are bound to their actions, have actions as their refuge. It is action that distinguishes beings as inferior and superior. I do not understand in detail the meaning of Master Gotama's statement. (coughs) If he wouldn't have asked him, the Buddha would have got up and walked away. So he asked to give a more detailed meaning. which he spoke in brief without expounding the detail, the meaning in detail. It would be good if Master Gotama would teach me the Dhamma so that I might understand in detail the meaning of Master Gotama's statement. (coughs) Then, student, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, the Brahmin student Sabha replied, the Blessed One said this. <coughs> Here, student, some man or woman kills living beings, is mur- <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Gets embarrassing coughing this much. Maybe we have to get some bubbly water. Here, student, some man or woman kills living beings, is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. 
because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution, dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, even in hell. <clears throat> but if on the dissolution of the body after death, he does not reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, but instead comes back to, to the human state, then whenever, wherever he is reborn, he is short-lived. That is why student, that's why students, that life, that leads to short life, namely, <clears throat> one kills living beings is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, <clears throat> merciless to all living beings. <clears throat> this is one of the reasons that crib births happen. And I've had a lot of criticism for saying this. But it doesn't take away from the fact that in the past, that person that is reborn, their past was very violent. So they have a very short life. <clears throat> but here, students, some man or woman abandoning the killing of living beings, abstains from killing living beings, with rod and weapon laid aside, gentle and kindly, he abides compassionate to all living beings. Because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a happy destination, even in a heavenly realm. But if on the dissolution of the body after death, he does reappear in a happy, he does not reappear in a happy destination in a heavenly world, but instead comes back to the human state then wherever he is reborn, he is long lived. This is the way, student, that leads to long life, namely abandoning the killing of living beings. One abstains from killing living beings with rod and weapon laid aside. Gentle and kindly, he abides compassionate to all living beings. So this is the, the reason that people live very long lives. One of the things of becoming a monk is that you learn how to develop your compassion towards all beings. And that, that takes place not only in future times of having long life, but monks, generally speaking, live to be about 20 years longer than the average of that country. And when, when a monk, for whatever reason, dies before they're 80, then you start going, oh, that poor guy. He didn't live very long. <clears throat> I, I went to another monk and I talked to him about this particular thing, he said, it depends on what you're doing in this lifetime, too. If your parents <coughs> are going, are, are getting close to death, <coughs> and they let you know that they're getting close to death, and you don't go see them, before they die, out of respect, you have a tendency to die younger. That happened to my teacher, Usil Ananda. He was only 78 years old when he died. About oh, 12 or 14 years before that, his mother gave him a call 
to America saying that if he wanted to see her that he was going she he was going to have to come back to Burma and at the time the Burmese government was very very odd and if he would have gone back to see her they wouldn't have let him out of the country again so he made the decision not to not to go see her he did talk to her as long as he could on the phone but her her strength was very weak and this monk seemed to think that that's one of the reasons that he died so young. He was only 78 when he died. Because the monk I was talking to was somebody that went to school with him when they were young boys. That monk is um, 80, this year 89. And he still goes out for walks of a mile and a half or two miles every day. He's still quite uh, coherent. He's, he spends a lot of time teaching, that sort of thing. So it's a real interesting uh, perspective that he had. He said the reason that he died, because he didn't go see his parents when they, did, when they were getting close to death doesn't matter what the situation was that he had. <clears throat> so, anyway. Here, student, some man or woman is given to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, with a knife. Because of performing and un undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is sickly. There, I, I have other friends that are monks that are getting close to a hundred, or they were a hundred when I met them. And this one monk in particular, he was 101 years old, he just stopped going out on alms round. <clears throat> and he had perfect eyesight, his hearing was perfect. And he had a lot of energy. There was another monk that I met in, in Malaysia. When he was 97, the, the center he was at, he had to go up three stories to get to the meditation hall to give a talk. And he could walk it faster than I could, and I was 40. <coughs> or 40, 42, something like that. And he got up and he started giving a talk on the value of keeping your precepts without breaking them. <coughs> and he said, you will not die an unnatural death. You're not going to die from accidents or uh, somebody attacking you or that sort of thing and you will live long see so it's a, it's a real interesting thing how past actions can come back at you even not necessarily in this lifetime <clears throat> but a lot of people especially in this country, they don't like to hear about being moral because it's been pushed down their throat in a lot of different ways. Keeping your precepts means that you will not die in an accident. You, you, won't, you won't die any other way than a natural cause. So it's a very important 
kind of protection that keeping your precepts gives you. There's a story in the Jataka Tales about <clears throat> this boy lived in a village where everybody kept their precepts very well, so he grew up keeping his precepts too. And he went off to school in a different, different town. And the teacher tried to entice him into breaking precepts, and he said, no, I won't do that. And he told him that everybody in, in his village where he lived died natural deaths. So this teacher wanted to test his father and he got some goat bones. And he went to his father and said, these are the re remains of your son. He was climbing up a hill, he slipped on a rock, fell down and died. And his father said, no, he didn't. No, I don't believe it. And he tried every way to convince him that his son was dead. And his, son, his father said, no, he keeps his precepts. He's not going to die an unnatural death. And finally, the teacher had to fess up and say that he was testing. So keeping precepts without breaking them. <coughs> allergy to the this stuff. Keeping your precepts not only leads to a happy life without guilty feeling of saying something that's not true or taking something that's not given or causing harm to somebody else. If you keep your precepts, it turns into a protection even if you get in a situation where you could be harmed. You won't be. So an awful lot of people in this country, they, when <clears throat> I came back to this country in 1998, I'd spent 12 years in Asia. And when I came back and I started listening to what they were saying on the radio, <clears throat> seeing what they were seeing on the saying on television, they were using such foul language, like there was no uh, no boundaries for anyone anymore. One of the precepts is not to use foul language. And it's starting to turn into normal kinds of speech that you hear people cursing all the time. And that's breaking a precept. As a result, a lot of people die from accidents and unnatural ways. When I got within about a hundred miles of the United States and I was on the airplane. <clears throat> I wanted to turn around and go back to Asia because I could feel the anger and hatred and fear and greed as getting close to this country. People that they don't take keeping precepts except maybe one day a week and the rest of the time they can do anything they want, they can say anything they want, and they think there's no harm in that. So, there's an awful lot of unhappiness in this country because people break the precepts and think it's nothing. But when you say something to somebody else and you know that that was not true, your mind says, I shouldn't have done that. 
I just told a lie. And you think, well, never mind. And you kind of forget about it. <clears throat> and then you come to a meditation center and you want to learn how to meditate and purify your mind. Breaking the precepts means that you're going to have a lot of hindrances arise in your meditation. There's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of problems of learning how to do the practice correctly. The way meditation is being taught in this country is they give you the five, five or eight precepts to start the retreat. They give it to you in a language you don't understand. And that's, you've taken your precepts. Now every morning you take the precepts here. Why? Because if during the day you broke one of the precepts, you did something that you shouldn't have done, your meditation is going to be lousy. And if that happens, I want you to come to me, tell me you broke a precept, we'll take the precepts again, and you can, you're, you've purified your mind that way. But I have to know what precept it was. There's not going to be any finger pointing. Yeah, you, there's mistakes that can happen. But the more you keep your precepts without breaking them, the more your mind becomes pure. And I gave a talk like this in Asia, in, in Malaysia, and they're Chinese. And finally this guy sticks his hand up. He said, okay, okay, you've made your point. How long do I have to keep the precepts? And I said, well, you can start at 100 years and go up from there. That's how long you get to keep them. It's, you, you don't feel, have any guilty feelings when you keep your precepts. Because when you take something that's not given, you know what it feels like to have somebody take something from you. So you go, no, I'm not going to do that to anybody else. I don't care how much I want that thing, I'm not going to take it. <clears throat> You're not going to harm, uh, we, on the, on the way up, in the road we saw a turtle. A lot of people that see animals like that, they, they like to run over them. And they think it's cute. Am I going to run over a turtle? No. I'm going to talk to him, tell him I wish him a good day. But I'm going to make sure that I don't harm that little guy. So there's no guilty feeling that can come up when I'm trying to purify my mind by sitting in meditation. And that guilty feeling translates into one of the hindrances. It's either going to be lust or hatred or dullness sleepiness of mind, restlessness, which is the biggest hindrance that happens for everybody. <clears throat> Sometimes I've been out in, uh, in public, be it an airport or something like that, and some guy comes down and sits at a table, and as soon as he sits at the table, he starts doing other things, and his leg is continually moving. That's a person that has a guilty mind. What did they do? I don't know, but they broke one of the precepts and that's how it manifests. It's pretty amazing because restlessness in itself is a painful feeling. 
And one of the reasons that you move a lot is because that painful feeling comes up and you don't sit with it. You try to ignore it, so you shift. People that meditate, they come in and they sit. That's it. There's not a lot of movement. There's not a lot of body twitches that happen. Why? Because they keep their precepts. There's times that I've been in places like museums and I'll look at something very closely and then, okay, I'm done with that. So I turn around and walk away and the person next to me is startled. I thought you were a mannequin. Because I wasn't moving. My mind was on what I was looking at. There's not a rest, lot of restlessness in my body. So keeping the precepts is the thing that you really have to understand does have good or bad effects, whether you break them or you keep them. And as you keep them for longer and longer periods of time without breaking these precepts, then a lot of wholesome, positive things start happening to you. And like I said, it is a protection. The precepts are not to kill, not to steal, not to have wrong sexual activity, not to tell lies, not to try to divide groups of people so that they're fighting, not to gossip. Gossip, what is gossip? Gossip is talking about somebody and making up stories. not saying what's actually true. And other people start believing that gossip and then that causes problems for a lot of people that way. <clears throat> so this is part of restlessness. Uh, the last hindrance is doubt as to whether you're doing the practice correctly as, as to whether you're on the path or not. These are called hindrances because when they arise they will take your mind away from your object of meditation very quickly and you get caught up and involved in thinking this and that. Now the beauty of this particular practice is that I insist that you use the six R's. Anytime your attention is pulled away from your object of meditation. What are the six R's? You recognize when your mind is distracted. You let go of the distraction by not keeping your attention on it. Just let it be there, but don't keep your attention on it. Move your attention over to relaxing the tightness in your head, in your mind. The tightness that comes in your head and your mind is not big, it's subtle. But that's how you recognize craving when it arises. Craving is the I like it or I don't like it mind. <clears throat> I thought I was going to have it happen again. <laughs> the way mind works is a feeling arises. Now I'm not talking about emotional feeling, I'm talking about feeling. Feeling is either pleasant painful, neither painful nor pleasant. Right after feeling arises, the I like it or I don't like it mind arises. If it's a pleasant feeling, I like it and I want to hold on to it. If 
it's a painful feeling, I don't like it, and I want it to stop. And right after that, and this, this happens very quickly, right after that, all of your thoughts, all of your opinions, your concepts, your ideas, and story about why you like or dislike that feeling comes up. And this is where you have the big sense of this being your thoughts, your feelings. Now to be honest, do you ask a feeling to arise? Do you say, <clears throat> I haven't had any painful feelings for a while, I might as well pull some up now so I can suffer. No, it happens by itself. It's part of an impersonal process. When you get to where you're making the stories about it, you're taking it personally. And that is a cause of suffering. Right after that is your habitual tendency. Now, you're made up of five things. You have a, a physical body. You have feeling, pleasant, unpleasant. <clears throat> you have perception. That's the part of the mind that uh, names things. Oh, this is a good feeling. I like that. You have thoughts. And you have consciousness. When a feeling arises and it's painful, our habitual tendency is to try to think the feeling away. And it doesn't work because feelings are one thing and thoughts are something else. And the more you try to think the feeling away, the bigger and more intense that feeling becomes. A few years ago, I was at a college and somebody asked me about depression. That seems to be a biggie in this country. How do you overcome depression? What do you do? Well, see how it arises. See what happens first. A painful feeling arises first. Right after that painful feeling, tension and tightness arises in your mind. Then your thoughts start, and then your habitual tendency to try to control the feeling with your thoughts, and that makes the feelings bigger and more intense. And that leads to the birth of action. Leave me alone. I don't want to be, I don't want to be bothered. I'm depressed. And you get into your thoughts and trying to control your thoughts more and more and more. And that feeling, that painful feeling keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So what to do? A painful feeling arises. As soon as you notice that painful feeling, you use the six R's, which I haven't gone all the way through yet, but I will right now. You recognize that your mind has a painful feeling in it. You allow the space for that painful feeling to be there. Don't keep your attention on it. If you keep your attention on a painful feeling, that painful feeling is going to get bigger and more intense. You relax that tension and tightness in your head, in your mind. As soon as you relax, your mind is clear, your mind is bright, and your mind is pure. Why? Because you've let go of craving. Now, <clears throat> you have... <clears throat> You have to bring up something wholesome. And that is smile. Sounds odd. A lot of Buddhists don't like the idea that you're supposed to smile, but they're the ones that suffer the most. <laughs> when you smile, your mind becomes light. And you become very observant. 
When you smile, it helps your mind to be more alert. Bring that smiling mind back to your object of meditation. Return. And repeat staying with that object of meditation for as long as you can. When you do this over a period of time, the, the amount of distraction becomes less and less because you're improving your mindfulness. And the time that you spend on your object of meditation gets to be longer and longer. As you stay on your object of meditation, your mind, I'm going to give you a definition of mindfulness. Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. This is key. It's not trying to control anything. It's not trying to make anything different. It's just the observation mind. That's what mindfulness is. Mindfulness right now is starting to be catch-all phrase and nobody ever gives you a really clear definition of it you're supposed to know what mindfulness means but it's it's just like the word wisdom everybody knows ah, what wisdom is that means to be wise right no whoops you can't use that word in the definition what is wisdom wisdom is developing the ability to see this process. And when you are able to see it, you can let go more quickly. You, your mind naturally tends to become more happy. <clears throat> That's the whole point of the meditation. It's learning how to naturally release and relax all of the suffering that we do when we try to control things. We can't make things happen the way they want to. They're going to happen the way they happen. But we can use the six R's and eventually there is personality change towards the positive because you're putting more and more wholesome things in your mind and when you put more and more wholesome things in your mind things like depression become weaker now this is a kind of hindrance depression the last thing you want to do when you're depressed is to smile or laugh. That's the last thing you feel like doing and that's the first thing you should be doing. You start smiling, you start laughing with yourself about how crazy your mind is. Everybody's mind is crazy when it has craving in it. So there's a, a big problem that we have because we keep take, taking everything personally. This is my feeling, this is my anger, I have a right to be angry because you're causing me suffering and I'm going to throw it back at you. But the truth is you are making yourself suffer by taking these emotional upsets personally and fighting with them. You wind up saying things that later you wish you hadn't said. You wind up doing things that you wish you hadn't have done. This is how wars start. And it's war within yourself. I don't like this feeling. I don't want it there. Then you try to think the feeling and then you come up with all kinds of stories justifying what you do when you have that kind of feeling arise in your mind. 
and you cause yourself suffering and you cause other people around you suffering because of that. So what we have to do is learn how this process actually does work and then <coughs> practice the way to change. Almost everybody that comes, well I say almost, I have to, I have to say that because a lot of people are born into Buddhism, they don't have a choice. But everybody that really understands what suffering is, they start looking for a way to let go of all the pain they go through. And it's, it's hard work, it's not easy to let go of this pain because we're attached to it. This is me, this is mine, this is who I am. Well, did you ask that painful feeling to come up? Did you ask all of those thoughts to come up and try to fight that painful feeling? Well, no, not really. It's an impersonal process that we're taking personally and that is the cause of suffering. When I give retreats in Asia and particularly, in particular, <clears throat> almost everybody that's practicing Buddhism, they know about the Four Noble Truths. And the first noble truth is suffering. And to them that translates into everything is suffering. And that's not true. The second part of the noble truth is, there is a cause of suffering. What is the cause of suffering? Craving. I don't like it. This is a painful feeling, mental or physical, it doesn't matter. I don't want that feeling to be there, clinging. All your stories about it and taking it so personally. This is my idea. This is the way it has to be because my, my mind has told me this over and over again. That doesn't necessarily mean it's true. What you have to do is understand that there is another noble truth that's really important. And it's the most important part. The cessation of suffering. Every time you use the six R's and you relax that tension and tightness, your mind is clear, your mind is bright, and your mind is pure. There's no thoughts in your mind at that time. But you bring that pure mind back to a smiling mind. That means your mind becomes even lighter and more alert. And you bring that smiling mind back to your object of meditation. Which is, for me, most of the time I'm teaching loving kindness meditation. And that is a good, happy feeling in the center of your chest. And it feels good. And a lot of people have a misunderstanding of what meditation actually is. The Buddha said there's three parts to your meditation. You practice your generosity. You take somebody as your object of meditation and you radiate a good feeling to them. But you can't radiate a good feeling to them unless you have it yourself. So you make a wish for their happiness and feel that happiness. And then give it away. That's generosity. And I've already talked about the precepts. If you truly want to be successful with your meditation, you absolutely have to keep your precepts. And this is a sometime, not a sometime practice, it's an all the time practice. 
just like generosity. You want to give in three different ways. You give with your, your body, helping somebody else so that they don't have as much suffering. You give with your speech, saying things that make other people feel good about themselves and feel happy. And with your mind. So, <clears throat> I just got through writing that book, Life is Meditation, Meditation is Life. There's no part of your life that you can't be meditating. And what Bhante was bringing up the, today at lunch, the word meditation is, it, it's changed a lot of ways that people think what meditation actually is. But the Pali word is bhavana, and bhavana does not mean ment meditation, it means mental development. Can you develop your mind so that you're happy and wish other people happiness while you're walking down the road? If you can remember to do it, yeah, of course. Or when you're standing in line at the, at the store or doing whatever. You're practicing your generosity by giving good feelings to people around you, mentally and physically, and through your communication. So this is a kind of mental development that is not, not just about sitting on a cushion. This is about true change and personality development. A lot of people that come here they're quite successful with their practice. They get to certain levels of the meditation and all of a sudden they, they go home and they say, everybody's telling me that I'm a lot more mellow than I used to be. I don't get so angry like I used to. Well, that's because you're changing. You're replace, replacing an old habit with a new habit. And the new habit leads to happiness not only for you but for other people around you. And this is karma too. What kind of mental actions or verbal actions or uh, bodily actions do you do? If you lead to the happiness of yourself and other people around you, you can be rest assured that good karma will come back to you. If you break the precepts, you cause problems for other people, you have, you want revenge because somebody else did something to you, you can look forward to those kind of problems happening over and over and over again till you learn that that's not the way to do it. That is karma. Now, oh, you're sitting in meditation and a hindrance comes up, okay? What you did in the past arises in the present. So you have a hindrance. What you do with what arises in the present dictates what happens in the future. You have a choice to make. You can fight with these thoughts and feelings and take them personally and get really caught up in emotional nonsense stuff or not. It's your choice. If you choose to fight with it and try to control it and try to make it be the way you want to be, you're fighting with the truth. Because this stuff arose, it's there. That's the truth. When a painful feeling arises, it's there. Anytime you try to change the truth, anytime you try to control the truth, 
Anytime you try to make the truth be the way you want it to be, that is a cause of suffering. So you have a choice. Fight with it. Have it come back over and over and over again until you learn that's not the way to do it. Or you can start using the six R's and letting it go and relaxing into these things. And a lot of people, they're absolutely shocked and surprised that this really does work. At all different levels, when you relax into things and not take them personally, let go and you start going deeper into your practice. That's the way it works. Now, the hindrances, as much as I was talking about them in a negative way, actually are very necessary for your practice of meditation. The hindrances are showing where your attachments are, where you're taking it personally. And then you use the six R's with the hindrance. At first, you come, you've never done any meditation before. You might get distracted for two or three minutes before you notice it. And then you've got to use the six R's to come back to your object of meditation and your mind goes away again for a period of time. But as you become more familiar with using the six R's, the length of time that you're distracted becomes less. The length of time you're stand, staying with your object of meditation becomes more. Now, as you allow the space for that hindrance to be there and you <coughs> relax into it, it starts to get weaker because you're not trying to resist it. You're not trying to control it anymore. And as it becomes weaker, it just doesn't come up so often. Finally, it disappears. When it disappears, you have a very strong feeling of relief. And right after that, joy arises. And you feel happy. And the joy will be there for a period of time. And then you will feel your mind become very tranquil and peaceful and your mind and your body become very comfortable and your mind stays with your object of meditation for a few minutes. It can be three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, whatever. Now what I just described to you is called a jhana in, in the Buddhist teaching. And jhana means a level of understanding. What kind of understanding did you gain from that experience? That this is part of an impersonal process and you start understanding more and more how to let go of things that used to catch you and cause suffering. And you start letting them go and they start fading away. That's how you purify your mind. So, I'll get off the soapbox now. Here, student, some man or woman is not given to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, with a knife. Because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is healthy. This is the way, student, that leads to health. Namely, one is not given to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife. Here, student, some man or woman is an angry, irritable character. 
even when criticized a little, he is offended, becomes angry, hostile, resentful, and displays anger, hate, and bitterness. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is ugly. This is the way student that leads to ugliness, namely one is of an angry and irritable character and displays anger, hate, and bitterness. Do you ever look at somebody who's angry? Their face is really not very pretty. In Asia in particular, the Asians, when they become angry, the skin on their face starts getting black. And you look at their face and it's really an ugly face. And that comes from identifying personally with that anger and making it their own and then throwing that anger around to other people. <clears throat> Here, students, a man or woman is not of an angry, irritable character. Even when criticized a lot, he is not offended and does not become angry, hostile, and resentful and does not display anger, hate, and bitterness. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if he comes back in the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is beautiful. And you, you can see this in, in people's faces when they come to the meditation center. And their face becomes very radiant. They don't have a lot of lines in their face. They start disappearing. They, they look really good. And some people, their, their face becomes so radiant, it's like you don't need any light in the room because the light coming from their happy mind shows through their face. And it happens more often than not when we're practicing loving-kindness meditation. It happens a lot. And that's one of the ways I tell that, oh, you're following the directions pretty well. Oh, your face has changed in the last two or three days. Your face is becoming very nice and radiant. And that's wonderful. Please keep it up. <laughs> <clears throat> Here, students, some man or woman is envious, one who envies, resents, begrudges the gain, honor, respect, reference, salutation, and veneration received by others because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is uninfluential. This is the way, student, that leads to being uninfluential, namely one is envious towards the gain, honor, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. Some people, no matter how good their ideas are, they try to convince somebody else and they're not listened to. Why? Because of this envy and resent that they've cultivated. Nobody wants to be around somebody like that, so they don't have any influence with other people. But here, student, some man or woman is not envious. One who does not envy, resent, and begrudge the gain, honor, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. 
But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is influential. This is the way, student, that leads to being influential, taking joy in other people's wins, being happy with them, not being envious. And because of that, you make the other people happy, they remember that, they start considering you as one of your real friends. And then you become influential with being happy with other people's success. Here's here, student, some man or woman does not give food, drink, clothing, carriages, garlands, scents, unguents, beds, dwellings, and lamps to recluses or brahmins. Because of performing such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, wherever he is reborn, he is poor. This is the way, student, that, le that leads to poverty. Namely, one does not share and give food. Why are you born in this country where there is so much food? Why weren't you reborn in Africa where there's very little food and people are starving to death? Because in the past, past you shared your food. The Buddha said if you saw the true advantages of sharing your food, you would never eat alone. You would always share your food with somebody else. So it's, it's a real good thing that you, you're born into this country where there is such prosperity, even though the government doesn't like that word very much right now. But it's, it's real interesting to be around somebody that takes this practice to heart. I had a teacher, he was my first real meditation teacher, and we would eat meals together. And he was always taking food off of his plate and giving it to somebody else. And we got in the habit of doing that because it was kind of fun. And I started, uh, if I'd run across a particularly good piece of fruit, the first thing I did after I took a bite out of it was cut it up and start giving it to other people. People started smiling when they saw I had fruit in my hand because they knew that they were going to get something really good. As a result of that and many other practices of generosity with food, I go out on alms round, even in this country, and I come back with more food than I can carry. I mean, it's really a remarkable thing to see. Every time I went out on alms round in, in Asia, I would come back with enough food for five people. It got to be kind of a hassle because carrying that much food is heavy and it's hard when you're walking three or four miles. You have seven or eight pounds of food, that's a big burden. But I couldn't refuse it because they were giving it to me out of happiness in giving. So if you want to never go hungry, share your food. And it doesn't matter who you share it with, if even members of your family. Like I was saying, if, if I was at a meditation center, I'd eat one piece of good fruit. I didn't eat the rest of it. I shared it with everybody else because it made me happy to do it. And it made them happy and they started smiling and looking forward to seeing me come with fruit. It was good fun. 
<clears throat> but here, student, some man or woman gives food and other requisites. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is wealthy. Why? You get what you give, right? When, especially when I was in Asia, I got afraid to tell people that I, I my nose is running. Because all of a sudden, eight or nine people would, co would come with some kind of medicine that I really needed to take. And they would come with boxes and boxes of Kleenex. It was pretty remarkable watching that. Now wealth, what does wealth really mean? In this country it means money. But that's not what true wealth is. Having what you need when you need it, you are actually very wealthy. I am prosperous because I I know I am prosperous. In my mind, I hold prosperity. I don't ever worry about things are going down. Oh, the money's gonna, we have, we have oh so much money on keeping this place running monthly. People come to me and say, well, we're just about out of money. I say, don't worry about it. Nothing to worry about. If you take care of Dhamma and practice your generosity, Dhamma takes care of you and it solves the problems. That one time, oh, we're almost out. We don't have enough money for the bills of the end, by the end of this month. Don't worry about it. Nothing to worry about at all. A man gave us 10 gold coins. That was like $15,000 the next day. Don't worry about it. What you keep your mind focused on, that's what you will get. If you get put your mind on focusing on lack, not having enough, worrying about not having enough money to pay your bills, the universe gives you that. When you start seeing the abundance of the universe, look at what we built here. I don't have any money. But look at this building. It's absolutely gorgeous. Because I knew the prosperity would come when I started pointing my mind towards what I wanted to see built. It really works that way. So, <clears throat> the more you can share and get, give people things that they make them happy, anywhere from kind words to kind thoughts, to happy thoughts, to material things. I have, even to this day, <laughs> I have an overabundance of socks. I was in Australia in the 80s, and the day that I arrived was the shortest day of the year there. It was the longest day on the other side of the equator. And it was starting to get cold. And I was starting to walk around. I was completely unprepared for cold weather. I'm wearing these light robes and all of this kind of stuff. And I have, I have sandals on. And I started thinking, you know, I'd almost give a kingdom away just for a pair of socks. It would be so nice to have a pair of socks. In a week, I had a dozen. 
people just gave me socks. They didn't know that I needed them. I didn't talk about it with anybody, but all of a sudden start, socks started manifesting. And just about every time I go out to go to another country, somebody gives me more socks. I, I went to California, came back with 24 pairs of socks. What am I going to do with 24 pairs of socks? I only wear one at a time. So I started giving them away. And as I give the socks away, they started multiplying, coming back. Almost felt like burning them. <laughs> but that's one of the, the true fun things about being a monk. A lot of people will give you things that they, they really think is special. They want to give it to you. And of course you have to accept it. That was the hardest lesson I had as a monk. I, didn't, I could never say, no, I don't want that. Because they were doing something and they were practicing their generosity. So, okay, I'll accept it. But what I do with it after I accept it is mine. So I accept with this hand, I look at it and I enjoy it and I appreciate the person that gives it and then I find somebody else to give it to. So it's uh, practicing generosity like that is pretty amazing. And it's a lot of fun. And that's the point of life, right? Having fun. Here's a student, some man is obstinate, arrogant, does not pay homage to, to one who should receive homage, does not rise up for one who's in whose presence he should rise up, does not offer a seat to one who deserves a seat, does not make way for one he should make way does not honor, respect, revere, and venerate one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Because of performing these actions, he reappears in a state of deprivation, but instead he comes back to the human state. Then wherever he is reborn, he is low-born. That's almost like, like being uninfluential. This is a way, student, that leads to low birth. Namely, one is obstinate and arrogant and does not honor, respect, revere, venerate one who should be honored, respected, venerated, and revered. Here, student, some man or woman is not obstinate and arrogant. He pays homage to one who should receive homage, raises up for one in whose presence he should raise up, offers a seat to one who deserves a seat, makes way for one whom he should make way, honor, respect, revere, and venerate one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Because of performing and uh, undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. If instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is highborn. Born into influential families that have a lot of influence over other, other people in a positive way. This is a way, student, that leads to high birth. Namely, one is not obstinate and arrogant and honors, respects, venerates, and reveres one who should be honored, respected, re venerated, and revered. Here, student, some man does not visit a recluse or Brahmin and ask questions. Venerable sir, what is wholesome? What is unwholesome? What is blamable? What is blameless? What should be cultivated? What shouldn't be cultivated? 
What kind of action will lead to my harm and suffering for a long time? What kind of action will lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time? Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in the state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is stupid. Have you ever run across people that they couldn't look like they could chew gum and walk at the same time? They just, they're not very sharp at all. Why? Because they don't ask questions. When I was with my teacher, Usila Nanda, who was probably one of the smartest men I've ever met, I spent two years with him. I asked him 20 or 25 questions a day. And he'd say, well, you should know that. I said, well, I don't. I'm a dumb American. I don't know anything about this. At the end of about two years of my continually asking questions, he didn't answer a question that I asked him. And I thought that was kind of unusual because he had extraordinary patience in answering if he knew I was sincere with the questions, which I was. And he stopped and he looked at me and he said, if you're reborn a human being again, you're going to be the smartest man in the whole world. <laughs> you're going to be smarter than Einstein. And because of the way karma works, I seem to attract students that ask me a lot of questions. So much so that I've told one student that on her gravestone, I was going to put, excuse me, can I ask a question? Because I get questions continually, even after 12 years. But I always come up with the answers, if I know the answers, that is. Now, one of the things that, that happened when I was in Asia, being around so many Chinese, they have, uh, their culture is such that they're told they should never question a teacher. You just don't do that. So, after I gave a Dhamma talk, I would say, anybody have any questions? And they're all sitting there and I could see on their face they really did it. Something wasn't clear, they wanted to know, but they were afraid to ask. So I pulled out this student and I said, the reason that you're reborn stupid is because you don't ask questions. All of a sudden, the hands started going up. They didn't want to be reborn stupid. But that was a cultural thing. I mean, it's, uh, Chinese are very peculiar in a lot of ways when it comes to um, being afraid to disturb somebody that's got a higher social status, so they won't ask questions at all. But that's how you learn, by asking questions. That's one of the ways you learn. Here, students, a man or woman visits a recluse and asks questions. Because of performing and undertaking such action, reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, wherever he is reborn, he is intelligent. This is the way student that leads to being intelligent, namely one who visits uh, spiritual teachers and asks such questions. But student, thus student, 
the way that leads to short life makes people short-lived. The way that leads to long life makes people long-lived. The way that leads to sickliness makes people sickly. The way that leads to health makes people healthy. The way that leads to ugliness makes people ugly. The way that leads to beauty makes people beautiful. The way that leads to uninfluential people makes people uninfluential. The way that leads to being influential makes people influential. The way that leads to poverty makes people poor. The way that leads to wealth makes people wealthy. The way that leads to low birth makes people low born. The way that leads to high birth makes people high born. The way that leads to stupidity makes people stupid. The way that leads to being intelligent makes people intelligent. Beings are owners of their actions, heirs of their actions. They originate from their actions, are bound to their actions. They have actions as their refuge. It is action that distinguishes beings as inferior and superior. When this was said, the Brahmin student Sabhad Todiya's son said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overturned, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost. Holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dhamma and Sangha of monks. Let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. So that gives you a fairly good idea about how karma works. And it's your choice of what kind of karma you want in the future. <clears throat> so, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yeah. So there's a realization that the Buddha made is that the present moment is just affected by the karma of the past, but the karma you create in that very moment. Right. Can you talk at length about how that works with karma? I already did. Didn't I? It works because you have a choice to make. What are you doing with what arises in the present moment? Are you going to fight it or are you going to let it be and relax? That dictates what happens in the future. Now the whole thing that a lot of people are starting to realize is when you start doing this kind of meditation in particular, you become much smarter than you were. Because you start making uh, decisions to the wholesome. And that makes you more aware and more alert as to how this process works. If you make the decision to fight with this stuff, you still have lessons to learn and you're going to go through painful things. But it's your choice. Everything, this is the ultimate in self-responsibility. So be responsible and see what you're causing yourself as far as karma. And there are past lifetimes that you've done that things might come up right now that are not particularly pleasant, but that karma, what are you doing with it right now? You want to change that a little bit so it's not so painful? Then you start letting go of the craving. 
And even if you become at the highest stage of awakening, you become an arahat, they still had their challenges. I mean, Mogalana, in a long time before, he had blind parents and his, his wife got tired of taking care of his parents while he was out working. So she talked him into getting rid of the parents and he was going to kill them. So he took, put them in a cart and they went out to some place that was very quiet. He started making a lot of noise like uh, uh, bandits and bad guys would make. And he told his parents that there's these bandits that are going to be causing all kinds of problems. And he started hitting his parents and hurting them. His parents started uh, yelling for him to run away. Don't worry about us. These bandits can kill us, but you got to get away. And he's the one that was causing them that kind of pain. In his last lifetime as an arahat, Somebody hired some bandits to kill him. And he was going down for alms round and these bandits got a hold of him and they, they really beat him up bad. They say, it says in the, in the text that there wasn't a piece of bone bigger than a grain of rice left in his body. Now, he didn't feel all that pain. Because he had a developed mind, he got into the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. So there wasn't any uh, suffering that he did, but he still had to go through that experience. When they left him alone, thought they had killed him, he comes out of this cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, sees what happens to his body, um, psychically, he goes to pay his final respects to the Buddha, goes off and dies. But he still had a lot of challenges, still as an arahat, because of past action. Even the Buddha had, he had uh, back pain in the last part of his life, from the, about the time he was 75 on, that's roughly. <clears throat> until he became until he was eighty, but he he started telling other people, "I have to lay down. My back is hurting. I'll uh, you give the you finish the Dhamma talk." And he remembered past lives and the lifetime that he was a very big, strong man, and he liked to wrestle. And what he did was. He would fight with these guys and he would pick them up and drop them on his knee and he would break their backs. Well, that came back to him. Even as pure as the Buddha was, as back pain. It didn't hurt him, but he knew that if he sat up longer, he wasn't going to be able to keep moving around, so he would lay down and take rest for his back. But he listened to the Dhamma talks. That help any? Yeah. Um, would you say that every time I hear this, it kind of comes to my head like, that faith is real, but your destiny, there's no such thing as a determined destiny because you have this choice. But Well, it, it, it all depends on when things are going to manifest on their own. When the conditions are right, this is going to arise. What are those conditions? I don't know. You can figure it out on your own. But destiny becomes different because destiny is definitely your choice. Right. You have choices. Right. Yeah. Well, how do, you, how do the eight worldly winds play into this? Is that the causes of 
You said winds? Eight worldly winds. I'm not familiar with that statement. Oh, oh, well, those those are worldly. They're they're not for the the monks so much, because you have enough equanimity in your mind that those kind of things are, yeah, okay. So it doesn't have to do so much with with causes and conditions that that bring something about. It's all interconnected. Yeah, it does. In the past, if you gave pain to other people, then pain is going to come to you at some point because of your actions. And we've been around for a long time. The, one of my favorite statements that Menindra used to make was, time immemorial. Beyond memory, how, how, you know, there's, there's expansions and contractions of the universe that take a long time. And we've been around for a lot of them. Doing this and that. That's why when the Buddha came, he said, how do you get off of this cycle of good things and bad things happening to you? How do you do it? That's what Nibbana actually is. Getting off of the wheel of sansara, of birth and death. How, how important or um, useful is it to, uh, to see one's past lifetimes? <sighs> Tricky question. Um, it can be real interesting and it can be a hindrance too. Uh, there was one man that, that came for five years. Every time he came I, I was sure he was going to break through and be successful. He would have memories of past lifetimes and he started following them to see what it was. That stopped his, his progress in the meditation dead. There are other people that they have physical pains that arise. They don't know what the cause of it is. You know, they got a bad stomach, uh, they got uh, pain in their joints or whatever. And they can remember a past life when they caused that kind of pain to somebody else. And what they have to do then is forgive themselves for causing pain in other people, and then ask them to forgive you. Sometimes they don't. They don't want to. But as soon as that does happen, eventually, if you keep after them, you keep after that memory, eventually they will forgive, and all of a sudden you don't have that pain in your body anymore. It just goes away by itself. That can happen. It doesn't happen all that often, but it can happen. It depends. Uh, see, the, the thing, the way the Buddha attained Nibbana, he got to the fourth jhana, where his mind had a lot of equanimity in it. And I won't teach anybody about past lifetimes until they get to that stage, because they, they get freaked out with some of the bad things they've done. Anyway, uh, it, you can start remembering your past lifetimes, and you can remember a lot, a uh, few thousand, whatever. I mean, it's, it's just like, and we're talking about past lifetimes. What did you do last week? It's past lifetime, isn't it? But what you do is you start remembering what you did last week, what you did last month, what you did last year, and you keep going back, and then you can remember being born, and you use your memory, and you can remember other lifetimes. After a while, 
your confidence in the way karma works becomes unshakable. And then your mind will start to go deeper. And then you'll start to be able to visit different realms, hell realms, heavenly realms, Brahma realms, that kind of thing. And then you start seeing how dependent origination really does work in everybody. And you will get to a place that's called the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. When you come back, the links of dependent origination and how this process works comes up and you attain Nibbana. I don't like to teach that way, but that is the fast track. I prefer teaching that you go through all of the jhanas because your understanding is much deeper when you do that. You start seeing how everything arises and that sort of thing. Which is the way Sariputta experienced it and Moggallana both. They went through all of the jhanas, the rupa and the arupa jhanas. But the, the Buddha was a particularly gifted individual that he had equal intelligence and sensitivity to feeling. So that was kind of a fast track that, that he developed. And there was a lot of monks during, the, during that time that did the meditation that way and, and were very successful. But these days and, and times, people get so involved with, I, I can remember 127 different lifetimes that I went through. And they, they take it all personally, like, not like it was a memory, but it, it's like it was a uh, actual experience and they can't change it, they can't do anything with it, they're just looking at it. And, um, it gets tiresome teaching that, so I stay away from it. So forgiveness meditation is beneficial for undoing past problems? Certainly can be. Depending on the attachments. present moment. You keep catching me with that. It's old habit. <laughs> no, he taught about the present. But you have to understand, I have 25 or 30 years of saying present moment and it's hard to catch myself. <laughs> I will eventually not say that. <laughs> and it's okay for you to tease me about it. It is, because that puts it back in my mind, so I'd try to do it, not, not do it again. Anybody else? Well, there's a, a, quite a few in the Anguttara Nikaya. There's, I wouldn't say a lot, but there's, there's a medium amount in the Samyut Nikaya. There's a few in the Majjhima Nikaya. I can't think of any in the Digha Nikaya, any forgiveness things there. Yeah. Right. So it says that the discuss karma. Nibbedika sutta. Nibbedika sutta. Is there a 
<laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's there's there's a few in in the Majjhima Nikaya. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, yeah, they're. The, but the most, I think, are in the Anguttara Nikaya, in one section. I mean, there's just a lot of them. There are these immediate defective karmas, and some karmas yeah. that won't definitely abandon, uh, and some karmas that will follow you for some lifetimes. Yeah. And if you really want to get good and confused, pick up the Abhidhammas. <laughs> I was just going to say, there's one in there that explains 12 different karmas. I'm, I'm not going there. I, I, I'm just ready to try. Just, <laughs> just, just, just oh, okay. by the way, we are not Theravada. We are Suttavada. <laughs> okay. I can say it by myself. Because we go by the suttas and the vinaya, and that's what the Buddha recommended in the Parinibbana Sutta. So, a lot of people they they think, well, there's Theravada, there's Vajrayana, there's Mahayana, and that's it. But we're going to start up another sect. Mahayana. <laughs> <laughs> they they hear me talk a lot about laughing and smiling. So he wants to call it the haha yana. Yana means knowledge. Mahaha. <laughs> Maha. Ha ha. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Let's share some merit then. <clears throat> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.